Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Who, uh, who flew in this year? Who built what they flew in on? Well, a couple of hands. Not bad, not bad. All right. Welcome to our Four Flight Power Users course. This is the last of these Power Users course, but I have some good information on that in a little bit here. This course is designed for folks that have been using ForeFlight for a little while, and they want to step up. They want to level up their usage of the app. They want to learn some new tips and tricks. We're going to go through a whole bunch of different features, some different scenarios and stuff that we could use the application for. The expectation is not that you're going to use these every time. What we want to do is build out your toolkit, build out the way that you know how to use things inside of ForeFlight, so that you can actually practice those on your device while you're on the ground. We do not want the first time you try and use these features to be when you're single pilot, IFR, partial panel, the engine oil is not looking too good, you have no idea where you are. Practice any of the stuff we're going to use today on the ground so that you can then use it in the aircraft without having to try and figure it out. You just know how to use that stuff. And this course is designed to help you build out that repertoire. My name is Thomas Darty. I'm one of the product managers at ForeFlight, and I focus on customer education, so building out courses just like this for customers all over the world. Many of you have seen me on stage here at Oshkosh for quite a while. This is my ninth, tenth Oshkosh now. Uh, so been here doing this for a little while. I want to point out the three plans that we have available for the individual market here in ForeFlight. We're going to be using features across all three of these plans. We've got our basic plan. These are all billed annually, but our basic works out to $10 a month, our Pro Plus $20 a month, and our Performance Plus $30 a month. And our Pro Plus, our Basic Plus, has all of the published information everything that you would need to replace paper with in your aircraft, you can replace that using our basic plus plan there. If we move up to our pro plus, we're gonna add a whole lot of situational awareness tools, things like synthetic vision, hazard advisor, profile view, ways for you to get a better picture of what's going on in your flying. And then when we move up to our performance plus plans, we're going to automate a lot of your flying. Things like weight and balance, things like takeoff and landing performance, those can be automated for you, making sure that you run them every flight. And then if you have something that comes up and changes your conditions, you can rerun it just as quickly and make sure that you're still safe, breaking those chains of some of the hazardous accident issues. Anytime that we use a, uh, a feature that's going to be on one of our top tier plans here, you'll see a little bug in the top corner up there that will either say Pro Plus and above or Performance Plus. So if you don't see it on your particular device, that's likely one of the reasons why. Come by and see us in the booth. Take advantage of that 20% off for upgrading customers. All right, hopping in here. We're gonna get started with some things that we can use while we're pre-flighting for a particular flight. How can we learn more about our route? How can we plan a better route around something? I have a little bit of a cross country here. We're going from Prescott back down to San Marcos, Texas. If anybody's familiar, it's my little airport that I like to fly out of on the south side of Austin. It's very nice, commemorative Air Force Base there, easy to get in and out of. But somewhere between these two airports, I'm gonna have a couple of things that I need to deal with. There's definitely a mountain range somewhere in the middle there. And it's also pretty sparsely populated, which means it probably has a whole bunch of special use airspace sitting over it. So I'm gonna turn on my aeronautical layer and immediately see that I've got MOAs and restricteds right along my flight line. I'm gonna need to find my way around all of these. So one of the things I like about the aeronautical layer in ForeFlight is it highlights special use airspace very brightly on there. So from a distance on my route, I can easily see all of those points. And now I know we're gonna have to do a little bit more routing than just direct to between these two airports. If I turn on my hazard advisor layer, I can see terrain and obstacles along my route that are going to be hazardous to us. 
For our purposes today, our aircraft is going to be limited to six, uh, 7,500 feet, using that uh, the altitude slider right along the side over there. So if I move that up and down, I'll see the terrain change. And so at our uh, artificial ceiling today, you can see that we have a whole lot of terrain we're going to need to work around. You may notice one other newer thing as you go and plan certain routes in ForeFlight right now. We've had a couple of people come up and ask me about this, and that is one of these little numbers in a gray circle somewhere along my route. You may have noticed them uh, as you've been planning out different routes. Those are operational note circles. So I have an option in my map settings here to turn on or off operational notes. What that means, if I tap on it, I can actually see information about the operational notes for this particular airspace. So I've got restricted altitudes in there. If you've ever done any flying in Europe, uh, that won't say one, maybe two or three. That'll probably say 14, 15 uh, different pieces of airspace you need to worry about. Uh, here, though, it's a great option for just not having to go through every piece of airspace. You can see the ones that have operational notes highlighted for you directly on your route. We also saw one other new small feature highlighted in there. When we were looking at that hazard advisor layer, we now include information about the highest peak and obstacle along each leg of your route. So if you have a lot of different legs, you'll see more of these as you load in. So if my ceiling is maybe not quite 7.5, maybe I could make it up to 8.5 on today's flight, maybe 9.5, I can see right there exactly what my peak altitude needs to be or my peak terrain is, and am I going to be able to clear that? So we highlight it nice and bright along your route. Now the easiest way for me to get around some of this terrain would simply be to press and hold somewhere in my route, drag that down south past all of my terrain, add in a nearby waypoint, call it a day. We're out of all of that terrain uh, in there. But I still have some of that special use airspace, and I also have a rather large, busy Bravo just off to the south here. I could try and skirt around it, but today, I want to try and work within that class Bravo. I want to fly through that Bravo as best as I can. If I switch over from our aeronautical to our sectional map, I can get some more detail in that area about different airport frequencies and things like that shown on the chart. But that's a rather busy chart for me. That's a lot of information to try and go through and make sure that I catch all of it. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on my sectional chart. And as I do, my sectional's going to turn into a tack. So if you're ever trying to find out where the tacks are in ForeFlight, just zoom in on a busy metropolitan, usually Bravo airspace, and it will automatically switch off to those chart inserts. Well, that's a bit better. I've got a little bit more zoomed in detail here. I've got information about some stadiums and some other waypoints along here, but it's still not the most useful. Because ForeFlight includes all of the charting information from the FAA as part of my US subscription, I have other options available for me of different chart types that a lot of us have never even seen at like an FBO you know, a shop anywhere or uh, you know, ordered from Sporties. The one that I want to look at today is called the US VFR Flyway Chart. So I have that directly inside of my layer selector there. Now, my layer selector may show quite a few more options. Uh, it's one of the perks of working for ForeFlight. But that US VFR flyway is going to give me specific information about operating around this class Bravo as a VFR aircraft. If you're unfamiliar with these, they're at quite a few airports around the country. So if you're flying regularly in one of these areas, or in a case like this, where I'm on a cross country that's going to take me around airspace I'm less familiar with, incorporating these charts can give me a lot of other info. If we zoom in on that flyway a little bit, I've got some great info on here. I've got some visual reporting point info here, like golf courses, 
some of the solar panel info there. Uh, I've got towers, I've got all this information along on here. And I've got these little reporting point flags on there. Who's familiar with the little VFR reporting point flags on the section? list? good, yeah, you see them around a lot on there. They're letting me know that that's a point where ATC may ask me if I can identify it and use that as a reporting point. We've now brought those into the aeronautical layer inside of ForeFlight. So now I've got the flyway chart and the aeronautical chart highlighted on here. And now all over my map, I have these green text bubbles over each of the flags there. And those are letting me know that th those are waypoints now available inside of ForeFlight. Because they're a waypoint in ForeFlight, I can treat them like a waypoint in ForeFlight. So I can tap on one and get information about it over on the right-hand side. Or for our purposes today, I can go ahead and drag my route over to one, lift up, and now I see that reporting point, that VFR point, as one of the options in my add to route box. So I can select that as my option, add it to my route, and then continue rubber banding my route over to the next point along my flight. So I can treat those just as I would any waypoint on an airway, anything else along my flight, they can be entered in as points. So it makes it fairly trivial for me to go through and follow the corridor lines through my flyway chart and add those all as waypoints along my route. Now I have the lateral path I need figured out as part of my chart. But there's one more thing that I need to figure out, and that is our vertical section here. So you can see that along my route lines here, I have 6,500, 5,500 or below, 65, 7,500 or below as I go through. I'm gonna need to make sure that I comply with those altitudes as I fly through this busy airspace. What can ForeFlight do to make notes of those air, the, that altitude and include that as my performance planning as we go through. We're gonna use a feature called per leg altitude and look at three different ways that we can bring up or change that information. Two of these are gonna be for all of our customers and one of them will be for Pro Plus and above on there and you'll see which one. So I'm gonna tap on the New River visual reporting point there and bring up my sidebar along the top up here and on the far right-hand side, I have a more option. If I tap on that, I see other things that I can click on, things like adding a hold. I can do an along track offset, which is to put a waypoint along my route, maybe 10, 15 miles before this route. I can get a weather forecast interpolated for that exact waypoint in there. So if it's far in between different uh, reporting stations, I can get that interpolated forecast. The option that we're interested in today is that set altitude speed time. Tapping on that, I have a new modal that pops up here where I can set my altitude, speed, and time. On my altitude up here, I've got two options along the top. I can either do a start at or cross at. What is the difference between those two things? A start at will begin my change in altitude from that point. So if I have a waypoint on the far side of a piece of airspace that I wanna fly over and then begin my descent in, I can use my start at to make sure that I stay at my higher altitude until I hit that waypoint and then start my descent in. Where my cross at will begin my climb early enough so that it will hit that point at that altitude. So we're going to use our cross at because we wanna make sure that we are 7,500 or below by the time we hit this waypoint before we go into the Bravo. So I'll select my cross at and then where it says no change right there, I'm gonna tap in and put in 7,500 feet. Notice now that I have an extra note next to my waypoint. So I have my new river visual reporting point and then 7,500 next to it. 
So that's one of the locations where I now have that noted on my route, on the chart. So if I get busy flying or I don't have the flyway chart up, I still have that information about what altitude I need to be. Another way that I can access this is by going into my profile view here along the bottom corner of my flight plan drawer. So I tap FPL along the very top, that opens my flight plan drawer, and then I hit profile in the bottom right hand corner. And that will allow me to see that side on profile view of my route with airspace, my route, terrain, obstacles. One cool thing that I can add in here, on my Performance Plus subscriptions, I can actually add in turbulence, icing, and cloud forecast into this profile as well, and then use this same per leg altitude to work my way around those forecasted hazards in my route. So another way that I can use this. But along the bottom, I'm gonna pinch to zoom in until I can find the area that I'm looking for, and then I'm gonna press the waypoint name along the bottom. In this case, it's my shooting range visual reporting point. I'll tap on that waypoint name along the bottom, and it's gonna pop up the exact same altitude speed time chart for me. I do the same thing. I set in my new altitude, and now notice that I've got a step down from my first waypoint down to my second waypoint in there. The last place that we're gonna look at setting this is to come into the edit option for my flight plan drawer. That's the edit, just to the right or to the left of profile. And then I'm gonna tap on my waypoint route bubble icon. That's what we call those little pills inside of the flight plan drawer. We call them route bubble icons. And if you tap on them, depending on what kind of waypoint it is, it'll give you different options. So if it's an airport, I can actually select an approach plate or a selected type of approach for that airport. In this case, because it's a waypoint, I can just do things like we saw earlier where I can insert before or after or set up a hold here. We'll hit that same time altitude speed and we can reset in our altitude there. So that's three places that we can add that in. I have it noted, not just here on the map, but also as part of my waypoint now in my flight plan drawer up there. So I have another place that it's warning me about that altitude change as I go through. And I can see that across my profile. So now I've got a great view of how I'm gonna work my way through this Bravo, both my lateral extents down here on the map and my vertical extents that are gonna keep me out of the Bravo and also out of the deltas underneath as I fly through. There's one other path that we could have taken here and we could have gone through the MOAs off to the east here. I would need to be extra cautious. I need to make sure that they weren't active or anything like that, but we could have flown through them. We're on a VFR flight plan. If I wanna see what their active hours are, I can press and hold anywhere inside of that airspace. And then in the add to route box that pops up for my particular point that I pressed and held, I see that I've got all of my airspace. One little pro tip I wanna point out while we have it up on screen. Notice my lat long at the very top up there. The last numbers past my lat long, that's actually my ground elevation at that point using uh, our high resolution terrain model there. So if I'm ever curious, you know, what is the elevation at a particular area, press and hold on it, and then I can see that past my lat long. Back to our MOA though, I can see my altitude extents for it. I can see some communication info here. But if I tap on details off to the right, I'll get even more information about it, including the hours of operation. Looks like they're 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, maybe on the weekends a little bit. That's great, they have a regular work schedule flying the MOA here. Except for the last little bit in here, which is intermediate by notums. So if they are going to be flying outside of those times, they're going to publish a notum for this airspace, letting me know that it's active. Where do I find that notum? 
I can just get in flights, I can get my briefing, I can see all of the NOTAMs along my route, and then I can compare all of those to all of the airspace that I would normally go through. Or I can open up my layer selector here and just turn on my NOTAMs layer. When I do that, I now have graphical NOTAMs highlighted over onto the map. So any of my NOTAMs are going to be depicted graphically in the airspace that they're taking place in. So I can tap on this red circle here, and I can find out that this is a restricted area for firefighting. It's been opened up by NOTAM. So now I have the information on the actual lateral extents. So normally if I were reading this through a briefing, I would see restricted area for firefighting, not the sort of thing I want to fly through, and then I would get a whole bunch of lat longs or a radius, and I would have to go out and map this myself. Now this is all up here on the map for me, so I know exactly where that takes place. I can also see information about my restricted areas off to the west here, where I can see that those are active by NOTAM right now. Importantly, what I don't see is that there is an active NOTAM in my MOA. So the absence is just fine here. It's letting me know that there isn't an active NOTAM for this airspace. So if I'm outside of the normal times, I shouldn't have to worry about it being active in there. One of the other places that we have this activated is down here in this large parachute jump area or PJA space that I have down here. There are seven, eight of them down here. Must be a lot of activity going on. We have those as part of the aeronautical layer. I see them in yellow with their altitudes over there as well. But I, now that I have the NOTAM layer turned on, I can actually tap on those and I can see the specific information about when those are going to be activated. So I can see operating times. I can see in this case in a specific frequency that they're going to be operating on. A lot more information that's going to help me not have to just be a nervous wreck looking for people flying through the air as I go through this area here. So I've got more information about that special use. All right, we've looked at a lot of the airspace here. Let's go back and look at our airport in particular and figure out how are we gonna get off the ground to begin with. All I've done here is zoom in on the aeronautical map all the way down to the airport level. One of the great things about that aeronautical map is that it has the airport diagram built directly in. I can see FBO locations, taxiway labels, even hotspots. Just by zooming in on an airport on the aeronautical map, I don't have to go and pull up a special plate and then you know, move off of that tab, then move back to see anything. It's all baked right in. If I go and open that airport up on the airports tab, I can see a whole lot of information about this airport. We have information on over 20,000 worldwide airports in here. One thing we occasionally get asked is, you know, back when I was flying with paper, I always read the AFD. I always went through and read the remarks through there, and I miss that now that I'm in four flight. I don't know where to find that information. We actually have it published right on the airports page. If you go to the info tab for the airport, and then scroll down on the left-hand column there, under chart supplement, I have the AFD. I can tap on that option, and it will take me over to the plates tab where I have the AFD for the whole airport in there. So I can see runways, I can see dimensions, things like that that I'm used to. I can even see things like my airport remarks section here. There's quite a few remarks for this particular airport, and it's a rather large block of text. Am I gonna be able to read that cleanly and make sure that I understand each of those items in there? Can ForeFlight do anything to make that a little bit easier for me to go through and see all of that stuff? If we go back to our airports tab, over in the right-hand corner, I have the comments button. If I tap on that, not only can I see airport comments and see things like, was it fuel getting stolen out of airplanes uh, in Colorado there? Uh, of good reason not to fly to that airport. But if I go along the top from comments over to remarks, we actually have all of the official remarks from the AFD broken out into individual lines. So that'll make it much easier for me to go through 
and figure out each one of the items in there as opposed to trying to read that large paragraph on the chart supplement. Something else that I'm going to need to take a look at for this airport is going to be notams. I can figure those out by along the top here, moving from info over to notams. And I see all of my notams broken out by airport, obstacle, center, JEP, anything that's in the local area. But that may be a pretty long list of notams for me to go through and try and figure out which one of those apply to me, which one of those don't, am I aware of everything that I need to look at. So recently we've added a filter option here at the top of the notams. So I can actually tap into that filter box there and then just like a keyword search, type anything in that I want to filter this by. In this case, I want to know about anything that's out of service. So I'll type in out of service, and then I'll see things like my runway end lights or my precision approach path indicator are out of service for, e for different runways as I go through. Notice that we're highlighting the text out of service in red as well. We do that for notams all across the app. Things like unusable, out of service, closed, those all get highlighted in red just to make it a little bit more obvious that this may have an impact for you. So now that I know everything that's out of service at this airport, what about the runway that I want to take off on? Well, I'm planning on taking off of 03 right, but there's no notams for that. Is that a bad thing? No, it's great. There's no notams for the runway. So instead of trying to go through and scroll through it and say, hey, I don't, I don't see anything for 03 right. I think I have all of the notams and I understand that there aren't any for my runway. Using the filter here, I can actually quickly verify that there are no notams that apply to that runway. So it just makes it a little bit faster for me to know that I'm not going to get impacted. I'm not going to be the guy on the radio that calls up to taxi to the closed runway or something like that. Speaking of runways, if I move over to my runway tab, I can see all sorts of information about my dimensions. It's pretty hot today in Oshkosh. It's a little bit hotter, a little bit higher elevation here in Arizona. I'm not used to flying at higher altitudes, higher density altitudes. I know I'm supposed to worry about that. And so the first thing I'm checking here is things like my runway dimensions, what my headwind looks like in here. You know, I've got pretty long runways here. But are those going to be long enough for my aircraft to take off on? I know I'm going to have an impact to performance. If I fly in mountainous areas or high altitude areas, there's a lot of things that ForeFlight can do to help me find out other information, make sure that I'm going to be operating safely in these areas. The first thing I want to look at is because this is a mountainous airport up here, I have that little mountain icon next to the name of the airport up top. I'll see this for any airport where I've got terrain in the local area. If I don't see this, that means that I, I think it's 3,000 feet is the altitude change required for this. I'll have, to, I'll have to verify that one in the pilot's guide. But if I tap on that, I'll actually see a little terrain pop up where I can actually see the max terrain, min terrain, and airport elevation around that airport in a 10 nautical mile radius. So now I understand what kind of elevation change I need to be worried about here. Am I going to be needing to climb up you know, for thousands and thousands of feet? Do I just need to get above a certain area? Things like that. Easy way for me to figure that out. I can take it a step further. And over in the right-hand corner where we were looking at comments, I can tap on 3D view. If I tap on that, I can actually get a 3D view of the airport with traffic flying around. I can pan and zoom around and see that uh, satellite imagery overlaid on top of the terrain data. I can even hit the little sun and moon icon in the lower right hand corner and move this from a day view over to a night view where I can see my runway lighting and approach lighting, my Pappy and Vassy accurately depicted for that runway. We take the actual runway information and then depict that graphically onto that satellite imagery here. You may have noticed a few airplanes flying around in this area. Anybody know what flight school is operating out of this? 
Embry-Riddle, a couple of airplanes flying around over there. Being able to look at that traffic fly around in 3D around the airport is going to give me a really good sense of what their local operations are going to be. Where are aircraft flying in? How are they navigating around the pattern? Where do I need to be looking for aircraft as I'm departing? To find out information about my weather, I'm going to go over to the weather tab on my airport. And here we have a whole bunch of information that I'm used to seeing. The METAR, the TAF, the MOS for these airports. But last year, we added the ability to bring in the daily weather. If I tap on the daily tab, I get what looks like a pretty standard 10-day forecast that the regular weather app on my phone has. Why is ForeFlight bringing this into my app? I, I need more than just the regular weather forecast information here. Well, if I tap on any of the days, I can bring in my daily weather modal, where now I have an hour-by-hour -hour forecast with additional information that applies to aviation specifically. Starting from the bottom here, I have the flight category across all 10 days of my forecast period here. So you, I can see in green along the bottom, I've got a whole lot of VFR coming up in Arizona here. But if I looked along the bottom and I was seeing blue, red, or even magenta, I would know that I have MVFR, IFR, and even low IFR coming up along my schedule. So if I'm looking, you know, if I'm sitting in the office on a Tuesday planning a weekend trip out somewhere into the mountains, and I look at the daily forecast and I see that Friday evening, maybe Sunday morning, I'm going to be looking at IFR or low IFR, may not be the weekend that we're going to make this trip in. So I can use that as a quick forecast. Coming up a little bit, I have information on my, there we go. I have information about my flight category, my ceilings, the winds, my uh, visibility down there, a whole bunch of different information that I have in. But if I tap on each hour as I go through, I can also get additional details along the top up here. One that I particularly like is that I calculate out my density altitude for this airport based on the forecast. So I can see that my forecasted density altitude at 2 p.m. on a Saturday is going to be just shy of 8,500. Anybody remember what the airport altitude is when we looked at the mountainous information? It was about 5,000 feet was my airport elevation there. So a little bit of an increase off of my airport elevation. We also highlight it in amber so that I know that that is a larger gap as I go through. Okay, well, I'm at a higher density altitude. How does that impact my flight today? I'm going to take my flight plan that we've been working on and press that little send to icon, the little box with an up arrow in it. Anywhere that I see that in ForeFlight, it means that I can take the information that I'm viewing right now and visualize that differently somewhere else that may be in the application. It may be the ability for me to share that with people, maybe the ability to print it. It varies by information of what I'm looking for. So here on the Maps tab, if I press the Send To button, I get a whole lot of options like plates or logbook or the ability to share my flight plan, but I also get my Flights tab. So I can go in and tap on Flights, and that will copy all of the information that I have as part of my map flight plan over to my Flights tab for a Flights flight plan. These are separate objects. The things that I have on my Flights tab and the things I have on my Maps tab are not directly linked. So if I make a change here on the Flights tab to this route or anything about it, I'll need to use the Send To button to get back to the Maps tab. Same if I go over to the Maps tab, I make an edit to this route, I'll want to send it back over to Flights. They're just separate objects in there, so make sure if you make any changes on one and you want to see it on the other, that you're using that Send To button. Well, on my Performance Plus plans, now that I'm over here onto the Maps tab, I have two additional buttons right there, Takeoff and Landing. 
I can actually use my aircraft's performance profile to go through and calculate my takeoff and landing information. So we'll tap on takeoff. It's going to bring me into a new screen here where along the top, I can pick my runway information and pick out a runway that's going to work best for us today where I can see its dimensions, the crosswind, tailwind, headwind components based off of forecast or METAR as I go through. And now right off the top, I have my headline information here. So I can see what my weight is, I can see my takeoff distance, my VR, and my 50 foot speed calculated right there for me at the very top of my screen. If I come on down further, I can see the actual METAR information that's going to be used for this planning. One of the things that's nice about this is notice that all the information in my weather over here is overlaid in blue. For the most part, anytime that I see blue text somewhere in ForeFlight, that means that I can edit it. So if I tap on it, I can make changes to this. What's nice about something like this is, okay, let's say that it's 37C, a little bit high pressure here for this takeoff. What if it's warmer that day? What if the forecast is wrong? What temperature is gonna be my limit? Can I go up to 42? Can I go up to 43 degrees on there? And am I still going to be able to take off off of that runway? So I can play around and do some situational planning to make sure that I know where my limits are. Anytime that I make edits to that, it's going to show me what information it's using for that runway calculation. So the numbers are all interpolated out of my POH from the OEM. We work with the OEMs to get their flight planning information and then bring that into ForeFlight for these performance profiles. And then I can always see what weather I'm using so I know what numbers ForeFlight used to give me my performance. If I scroll down a little bit further, I have another option in here called safety distance factor. And you can see that I have 1.3 in there. The safety distance factor is how much on top of the book value do I want for my actual calculated distances. By default, it's set to 1.0. But I am not the test pilot for my aircraft on a good day flying exact book numbers. I like to have a little bit of margin in my calculated numbers to what my type of confidence is in the airplane. So in this case, I've moved it to 1.3, giving me 30% extra onto those calculations. That's my personal safety factor for any runway or landing number that I have. That way, I don't have to be perfectly on my game to hit the planned numbers that I have in there. So use that number to your advantage to set what you're comfortable with as part of your book values. Below that, I have a broken out list of all of my performance values. So I can see my rotation speed, my ground roll distance, my 50 foot, all that sort of stuff, including my initial climb rate here in feet per minute. I'm gonna get pretty good performance right off the runway there. That's not too bad. Am I gonna get good enough performance to clear my terrain though? That number does not tell me that. What number am I looking for to let me know if I'm going to clear terrain? I'm looking for foot per nautical mile. That's the information that I need. So what I'm gonna do is hit the summary button up in the top right hand corner and now I get a different version of this piece of information. So I still see all my 50 foot, my ground roll information here, but notice down along the bottom here, I have all engines operating climb capability here, where I can see my different altitudes, calm winds, 10 knot headwind, or tailwind, 20 knot tailwind, and different temperatures, and I can see what my foot per nautical mile climb gradient is going to be at those different conditions. So I can go through and plan out, am I going to be able to maintain the required performance numbers across all of my fields here? So very useful if I'm flying in mountainous terrain. It also is great after my takeoff, if I'm in cruise and I wanna know if I'm going to be able to continue a climb out, 
I know what the calculated performance for my aircraft at that weight's going to be. So very helpful chart to have in the aircraft with me. I just hit the back button up at the top corner there and that'll take me back into my flights view where I can go on and get my briefing and things like that. But we're gonna scroll down a little bit and we're gonna look at the payload section. But notice that I have one person in my aircraft. That's fine, that's me in the airplane, but we're going on vacation out in the desert and I think that the family might wanna come along with me. Should probably plan for more than one person and the aircraft here, and I need to see what impact that's going to have on my performance. I'm gonna tap the weight and balance button along the bottom down there, and it's going to take me into a weight and balance profile attached directly into my flight. So all of my fuel numbers have come, on, uh, come over, my aircraft profile has come over, I can see all of my payload as far as my seats go, so if I want to put more passengers in, I'm just going to tap the blue numbers along the right-hand side and load the aircraft up with the rest of the family and our bags. Along the top up there, I'm still going to have my CG profile so I can see how close I am forward or aft, and I can see my limits like maximum takeoff or maximum landing weight. I managed to get it right at maximum takeoff weight there. Uh, had to move a couple numbers around in there. And now if I go back into things like my takeoff performance, I can see that my original takeoff distance, which is about 3,200 feet, is now gotten bumped up to 4,400 feet. So adding that additional weight into the aircraft has made a significant impact on there. So running those numbers is important. What I like about having this so quickly to run through is I can run my weight and balance beforehand. I can take a look at those numbers in there. And then somebody brings an extra bag with them. Oh, we found an extra passenger in the FBO that we're gonna try and bring with us. Plans change as we go through. If I took a long time running these calculations, we're running late, I know that there's weather coming in, what are the odds that I rerun those numbers? Pretty low. So by having this information, a single button tap away as part of that takeoff calculation, I can always break that chain of errors there. I can rerun the uh, takeoff numbers, have my new calculation. That may change some of my perspective on this particular takeoff. If I come down into my fuel policies, and I will point out we have been looking at some of our performance plus features here. If I come down below my weight and balance, I can see my fuel policy information here as well. I like to point this out because most of us don't ever modify this policy here. By default, it's going to show me the minimum fuel required for my trip. Because as a pilot, that's what I always care about. What's, how much fuel is it gonna take me to get there? How much fuel do I need to get to, desti to my destination? If it says that I'm going to burn 54 gallons in this flight, who goes out to their airplane and has got the pipette out measuring 54 gallons exactly in that airplane? Never fly with that. The airplane's always got a different fuel amount in it. So if I come down into my fuel policies, I can actually set different numbers in here. So I can move from minimum over to my maximum. Now the maximum here does not mean that I fill the tanks up. The maximum is how much fuel can I bring. So it's going to take my payload information into account when it shows me how much fuel I can take. So the tanks may hold 90, but with payload, I may only able, be able to get 75 gallons into the airplane. So it's gonna let me know what that number is. The more fuel I carry with me, the more that's gonna impact things like my takeoff and my performance throughout the flight. So having those things tied together is going to give me that information. I can also do things like extra fuel or manual fuel. There's a bunch of different options in there, but use those to set the actual amount of fuel you have in the aircraft and then see what that has an impact on your flight for. Speaking of fuel, if I go back to my airport, in the upper right-hand corner, 
I can always tap on that FBOs button. For anybody who was listening to Jeremy early in our fundamentals, we were looking at some of this. I can see my FBOs. I can see their current fuel prices on there. I can tap in and see additional information. I do want to point out that you can also see the update fuel price buttons in there. So if you ever get somewhere and the fuel is not what was advertised, where I can see that is last updated five days ago here, right underneath my fuel, I can always go through and put in an update and let my fellow pilots know that, hey, they just changed the price this morning. This is the new fuel price. I'll point out that we also have, at supported airports here, different fuel types. So if you are moving over to UL94 or 96 or MoGas, we also have fuel prices in there, and we're continuing to build out our database of information on those new fuel types, along with our 100 low lead and Jet A options. All right. 55 minutes talking about pre-flight in there. Let's talk about some in-flight options, things that we can look at while we're actually having fun flying the airplane. So we're out of our des uh, uh, departure airport there, flying along, got my Sentry ADSB receiver in, giving me that in-flight traffic. And wouldn't you know it, right as we're going through the pass south, there's an airplane right along our route in there. I don't know what that guy's doing, but it looks like he might be about to cross our flight path there. What's great about the new ADSB traffic breadcrumbs, if I tap on that aircraft target, I can see information about it, what altitude, things like that. And with the breadcrumbs, I can figure out, is that guy flying maneuvers, maybe ground rough maneuvers, right along my, my flight path here, moving back and forth? Or is this person on a cross country, just like I am, flying directly straight through? That's pretty quick for me to be able to understand, is that plane almost certainly going to continue its flight directly through my flight path? Not going to be an issue for me. Or are they doing maneuvers and I need to either make a radio call out to them, let them know that I'm looking for them, or keep an extra close eye on that traffic as we fly through that area. As we get a little bit closer down to the Bravo down there, those live alerts inside a foreflight are going to do me another favor by letting me know about additional airspace that I'm about to fly into. So we highlight it there in a note and what sector of airspace we're about to fly into. I can see the altitudes up there, 8,000 to 9,000. I know that I'm gonna to need to be descending down in here, so that can be a great reminder to me that, hey, I'm a little high right now, I need to go through and start my descent, otherwise I'm gonna break into this Bravo in about five minutes. Or if I continue down, I was never supposed to be in any of the deltas, but if I see that note pop up, I probably got distracted looking for traffic, making radio calls, forgot to level off that descent, and now I'm way too low. About to fly into one of the deltas where I don't belong and I don't feel like busting that airspace, having that alert is going to give me a heads up there. We get out of the Phoenix area, we're headed on east, and it's starting to look a little bit darker outside than I thought it was going to be. I don't really feel comfortable VFR in the mountains at night, single engine aircraft, not my kind of flying. If I zoom out a little bit, I can see that day night overlay. So I can see exactly where sunset is across the globe. Yeah, we're not gonna make our destination. We're definitely not gonna make it out of the mountains here and there. So I can see that line right across the globe there showing me where sunset is. So a handy little feature, just to bring some of that information in. Let's start looking for an overnight. Where can we land the aircraft, make a diversion? I've got a bunch of options here along the route there, but not every airport is created equally, particularly not for my particular flying today. So I'm gonna open up my settings gear there, come down into the side menu over here, and open up the airports filter. That's going to allow me to filter my airports based on different criteria. You can see that I can filter out seaplanes, heliports. Neither of those airports are, are those, you know, are going to do any good for me on today's flight in there. I can also filter out other fields like restricted or military options in there. But we have a new option down closer to the bottom called minimum runway length. So now I can actually tap into this 
and I can filter out airports based on minimum length. So as I start to increase the length of runway I require, more and more airports are going to disappear off of that list. So I can go through and see what airports are at what length. The airport doesn't disappear entirely. I can always press and hold on the map there, find nearby fields. I can go through and go to the airports page, but this gives me a good visual reference as to what airports are actually gonna be useful for me today. I can also bring in other layers like our flight category layer here, which is gonna show me what airports are VFR along the way or IFR. I can bring in things like my dew point or temperature spread and find out information about maybe where the clouds might be at that airport or how hot, what my density altitude might be based off of that info. Or I can look at things like my surface winds. Here on one of the airports, I have a little wind barb right over the airport icon there. And that's that surface winds layer. I don't exactly remember what that speed is depicting on there for me. I've long forgotten to read that chart. Well, that's fine. If I tap on that icon for my surface winds, it's automatically going to bring me into the weather section inside of my airports page here. If I have an airport layer up, things like flight categories or temperature, surface winds, when I tap on it, I've told ForeFlight that I care about weather right now. So ForeFlight is gonna take me directly into the weather information for this airport. At the very top, it's also gonna show me what that winds uh, number is. So I see that same barb, and then it tells me exactly what my surface winds at the airport are. So it's just removing an extra step out of my flight planning so that I'll take more information about each of these airports I might divert to. I can also look at things like my 100 low lead layer here. So I'll come over into my layer and look at my fuel layer for 100 low lead. And now I see different fuel prices along my routes as I go through. What's great about that is if I'm making a diversion, I care a little bit about fuel price. I don't want to land somewhere where it's 25 bucks a gallon or anything like that. But if an airport has fuel on the field, it likely has other services as well. I can find out more information about that. So if I'm flying with passengers who aren't going to be particularly pleased if we land on a crop duster strip out in the middle of nowhere, and we've got to walk for miles into town, I can use this layer to quickly find out information about FBOs or services at each of these fields. I can tap on those available options and see things like their amenities where I can see that they have things like a courtesy car, showers, bathrooms, anything else that I might need at the field. That information is available for me here. We're not in an emergency. I can take a little bit longer to go through and make good aeronautical decision making about the airports that are going to be good diversion spots for me. I can go into my comments and I can look for additional information about these fields. So I can see that folks are saying that this is a nice place to make a fuel stop. The FBO is good. I can see if there's a door code or an after hours fuel phone number here, one of the options we see. I may be landing after hours and still want to get fuel. That number may be on a poster board somewhere inside the FBO, harder for me to find. Here it's right here in ForeFlight so I can give them a call. If I go back to my airport info by hitting the FBOs button on the top there, I can also see my runways available. Now, I was never planning on landing at this airport. I should probably make sure that there's no risk that we're not gonna have, we're gonna have enough room to make our landing. So I'm gonna go back over to my flights tab and I'm gonna tap on my original destination airport over here. Just tap on the blue name and I can switch that over to my new destination based off of my diversion. When I do that, I can then go back into my landings button there and I can run calculations for my landing based on my new flight. So I can see what my landing calculations are going to be. If I've got ADS-B in the aircraft, 
it's going to update those runway or the weather information based on the latest METAR. But if I don't, if I'm not picking up information over ADSB, but I still have that information over AWOS or ASOS, I can still go in to my information over here and manually enter in that METAR information. So if I don't have access to that for some reason, I can still use this as a tool for calculating out my landing distances. And that gives me just a great peace of mind to be able to go in and say, yeah, it's a 1,300 foot ground roll. We've got long runways. I've got nothing to worry about in here. But I may not have known that information before I ran this calculation. If I go through and make my fuel stop here, and I want to make sure that everyone else knows what a great FBO, what a great airport this is, and I want to leave my own comment, I can always go through and hit the plus button up on the top of the comments section here for this airport and leave my own comment. I can go into our new comments modal and I can type in that, hey, this was a great fuel stop. Uh, fuel stop. Staff was friendly. Here's other information you might want to know. And then I can save that as a draft. So maybe I put some information in and I forget about it. I get busy getting the airplane tied down. Saves it at a draft. I can always come back and see that information. Or when I'm ready to publish it, I'll hit publish over in the top right hand corner over there. And it'll submit this for review. We do actually look at all of the comments that get submitted. We try and make sure that they are somewhat relevant to flying in and out of these airports as we go through. And if I want to check the status on my uh, particular comment, if I open up the more drawer, that would be the one time that it finally quits on like the last couple of slides uh, on there. That's funny. If I open up the more drawer and then scroll down until I see comments in there, I can actually see the status of all of the comments that I've made across all the airports, all the FBOs. I can tap on them and make edits as I need to. So if I make an unfortunate typo while I'm out at the airport, I can go back and fix it. And then if I need to get rid of a comment, I can always swipe from right to left to delete that comment in there. That swipe from right to left works on a lot of objects inside of ForeFlight. So if I want to get rid of an aircraft or a flight plan or anything like that, I just, on top of it, swipe from right to left, and then the delete button will appear over on that right-hand side. That was an hour and five about some different tools inside of ForeFlight. We could have gone for six more hours and probably not gotten through everything. How do I learn more about using ForeFlight? Well, these are a couple of great resources for you. You've got things like the pilot's guide inside of the documents catalog. That's the operating handbook for the app built directly into it there. So you can go through and have that for use in flight. So you can reference different information. You can search through that. You can also come in to our foreflight.com's backslash videos option in there, where we've actually made YouTube videos on a lot of the different features that we have in ForeFlight. That's also where you'll find this exact presentation in probably about a week or so. We'll have this up ready to go on there. But the best resource you have, I mean, half the reason to be a ForeFlight user is to have that pilot support team. You can reach them at team at ForeFlight. We really do take support seriously. We know that this product is mission critical to, for you to fly around on. We want to support that at the same level. So team at ForeFlight, that's our pilot support team. They're all pilots. They're all ForeFlight experts in there. And they're standing by to help you out. We had a guy come by the booth yesterday who was teaching a ground school class, and he wanted to show what good support looked like. So he emailed at the start of this class, of his class, team at ForeFlight, and then three minutes later, he had a response for that question in his inbox in the middle of this class in there. That's the kind of response time we're aiming for, is to get you an answer in under five minutes from the support team. So fantastic job by that group. They've been in the airplane. You don't have to explain what ailerons are or explain what an ILS is. They know it. They've been there. They're there to help you out. But if you don't get your question answered, team at ForeFlight or just come see us when we're out here.